So thank you, Tanya, for a great uh, introduction and talk. That way. The only problem that I have with this talk that it's did a spoiler for half of my talk. <coughs> so I'm not used to speaking somebody speaking so well before me. <laughs> Usually, I need to correct what they're saying, so or to argue what they're saying. But here, there are a few slides that are exactly the same slides. So it will be a shorter topic. <coughs> As a teacher in, uh, in the medicine, medical school and uh, in the biological school, the students are never angry that you show them the talk. So I guess it will be the same here. So a few words about myself. I'm a biologist. I did a PhD. I did a master's in biochemistry, a PhD in molecular and genetic plant biology, and a postdoc in the cancer institute. So in the cannabis. Uh, in, in the cannabis uh, field, I'm coming with three angles that usually a scientist don't have. I have a very good background in biochemistry, I have a very big background in plant biology, and I understand cancer and other diseases, uh, which can bring my lab to work a little bit like a holistic lab, that gathering all the fields from the plant through the biochemistry, to the diseases and, and, the, and the cell uh, pathways. Um, I'm a professor in the Technion, which is the Technology Institute of Israel. It's similar to the MIT. We don't have uh, literature and other stuff. We have just accurate science in, in the Technion. And let's start my talk. So cannabis. Cannabis is look like that usually. People are known on the finger shaped leaves of the cannabis, but actually we are using the flowers. And the reason we are using the flowers is that in the flowers of the cannabis there are small hairs. And in the basic of the hairs, these trichomes that are specific cell that produce specific compounds called cannabinoids. We call it phytocannabinoids because it's coming from the plant. We are known today over than 140 different cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, which are uh, secondary metabolites that, uh, as Tanya explained, can bind receptors in our body. There is one phytocannabinoid uh, named THC, which consider the main psychoactive phytocannabinoids. There are others like THCV, but he is the, the major one. And actually, if we use uh, plants without THC, usually we won't feel the high feeling or uh, we won't be stoned. And there are many chemovars, many types of cannabis plants that have low amount of THC, so when we absorb them, we won't be high. These compounds coming actually in the plant as an acid form. If you look on this compound, this THCV, there is a carboxyl here. And in order to bind CB1, the THC, in order to bind CB1 receptors in our brain and give us the feeling of high, or, or it needs to be decarboxylated. And we're usually doing it by giving a boost of a heat or a light. This is the reason people are smoking cannabis, using bangs, cookies, whatever, without a boost of a heat, you won't feel it on, the, or on your body. It doesn't mean that the acid form is not active as a medicinal form, but we won't feel it on our body or, or we won't feel the high feeling that cannabis can, can cause. Again, as, as a physicians or scientists, we need to remember that the, the nature has produced this structure and it's very active too. So all the phytocannabinoids in the plant starting in, as an acid form and can transform to the regular, to the form that is after decarboxylation, after heating the molecule. So we call it THCA, THC acid, and after heating that, THC, CBDA, which is CBD acid, after heating CBD, CBGA. And I can go on and on until 144 different names. Okay, so this was cannabis. As, as Tanya explained, Cannabis is affecting our body so powerful because our body produces these molecules too. We have the endocannabinoid system. So as a plant, is a very unique plant. There is just seven plants that I'm familiar that produce these compounds. 
and the other six producing very, 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 very low amount. Actually, cannabis is the only plant that produces this compound in high amount. But if you're going to animals, all animals except insects producing these compounds, as Tanya explained very, very good, our body produces this compound because this is communication between cells. Cells in our body need to talk. Cell is the basic unit of life. We have creatures that are one cells, yeast, bacteria. And in our body, one cell, if we're taking it out and put it in plate, it can grow, it can move, it can do everything. But in the body, it's living in an organ and need to communicate with other cells. And they're communicating by sending signals. Again, sorry for repeating a little bit what Tanya told. I said that she did a spoiler for me. Okay, so they need to communicate. And they communicate by sending real messages, real chemicals. We call it hormones, we call it cyto cytokines. In the endocannabinoid system, we're calling it endocannabinoids. And these endocannabinoids, this is a message, this is a pigeon that we're sending to the other cell. In the other cell, something needs to capture it and to read it. And this, this, something, this something, we call it receptors. So in the endocannabinoid system, we usually talk about two receptors. In Israel, we said in the army that everything is divided to three. Every platoon has three, three divisions, every, everything in the army is three. In cannabis, everything is two. It's more simple. We have two phytocannabinoids, THC, CBD. We have two receptors, CB1, CB2. We have two uh, endocannabinoids, Ananda, my 2 ag We don't need much more than this. But this is flat. We have much more. We have, as Tanya mentioned, we have many other receptors. We have GP, GPL55, GPR18, GPR3, GPR6, GPR12. We have the TRPV1. In my lab, I'm working on 30 different endocannabinoid receptors. 30 different. And these receptors will express differently in different cells. And I will talk about this in a moment. But also the endocannabinoid, the message, the pigeon that's being sent. We're talking usually anandamide, the 2 ag anandamide similar to the TEC, 2 ag similar to the CBD, or mimic it, or something like that. But actually, in the blood samples, in my lab, I can recognize around 150 different endocannabinoids like. 150, which make this system extremely complicated. Every cell in our body has the same textbook, have the same, um, I forgot the, the, the right terminology, when you're cooking, a book that you're cooking, a recipe. recipe book. Okay? We have an egg and a sperm, they're getting together, we have the first cell, first delight egg. We divide, divide, and divide, and divide, and after nine months, we have a, a nice crying baby. When he's coming 16, is less nice, eating much more. But when he's born, you have everything. But it started from the same cell. Divide, divide, we have the same recipe. But every cell in our body will go to this recipe, we call it DNA, and read different chapter. He will read how to make cakes, and we will call it a skin cell. And then it will be different cell will go to different chapter. They will read a little bit from chapter three, a little bit from chapter nine. We call it neurons. They have the same recipe, but they will read different things. And these things are proteins. Which protein the cell express will determine how we look and how we act. The receptors are proteins. So every cell, depend on the type of the cell, will express different combination of receptors and will act differently. As Tanya said, these messages, these endocannabinoids are highly degraded, fast degraded, they produce in a specific located, location and will degrade very fast. Why? It's a homeostatic sy system. When I started to work with cannabis around four years ago, I started to read about cannabis and I have two talks to, today, so this is an introduction, and then later on I will talk about my research. But when I started, I started to read about cannabis, and I am not a cannabis user, so I am not a big fan of cannabis. If it was spinach or cucumbers, it was much easier for me. It's not, but... So, 
when I started reading on cannabis, I read that it's reduced seizures, it's increased appetite, it's reduced inflammation, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, good for reducing anxiety, it's uh, good for heart uh, beating, except of growing hair is doing everything. <laughs> it's not growing hair, I checked. <laughs> And this is not made sense as a biologist, but when you understand the system and we had a great introduction, you understand that this system is actually sitting on top of other system and balancing it. It's a homostatic system. When we are moving, working near a barbecue and we're smelling the barbecue and it's increased our appetite, it's because small molecules from the burned meat is entering to our nose. nose going to our olfactory system, signaling to a neuron that produces specific endocannabinoids that will bind the specific receptors in the cell nearby, with signaling to our pancreas to create insulin, and there is a feedback loop that increases our appetite. There is two ways to feel hungry. One is when our uh, stomach, our intestine is shrinking, and it's signaling to our brain. We all know what's happening if you won't eat two days. Right? We feel it and we become hungry. And the other way, you finish a whole meal and then come the dessert. Right? <laughs> We're all suffering from it today. But think about the hunter 5,000 years ago that ran after a deer for two days, succeed to hunt it, now put it on the fire, starting to eat, and after a few bites, it's totally full. The brain is telling him, keep eating, you don't know when will be the other meal. So to, we're suffering from this today, but this is extremely important machinery that we have, and it's the endocannabinoid system. When we have a scratch here, and a little bacteria is entering, and we have a small inflammation, the meaning that the body is understood that there is somebody uh, in vape, and he sent all his army, sent the T cells, sent the any killers, sent the macrophage, and they're all reaching, and they need to communicate between themselves. Said, hey, I'm taking from the right, you throw the grenade, elevate a little bit the heat, you know, everything. But when they finish the fight, and they won the battle, they need to communicate in, going, in order to go back to the base. And the T-cells is asking the macrophage, are you down there? And he need to signal it. This signaling, this is the endocannabinoid system. It's the one that's shutting down the immune system. It's true that we have also cytokines and other things, but the endocannabinoid system is extremely important. But this is a really location area. It will happen here. This macrophage will send a signal to the T cells. Okay? It will be here. It won't affect the receptors that are in our brain. It might be different receptors, and also the location is extremely important. Cannabis is producing the same molecules. It's not the same molecules, it's similar molecules, so molecules that activate the same pathway because as Tanya showed you, they don't look similar. But they activate the same receptor. So we said on the trichome, there is a specific cell. It won't be shorter than that. So on the trichomes, there is a single cell that produces these unique compounds, the cannabinoids. And the cannabinoids, as the body produces a lot of endocannabinoids, the cell produces a lot of phytocannabinoids. There are 10 different families of phytocannabinoids. And these 10 phytocannabinoids create around 140. The exact number that I know to identify from the plants are 144 phytocannabinoids. So these phytocannabinoids, when we take them, when we absorb them, so in a single plant, in the Singdale cannabis, we'll have around 100 different active compounds. So they, these cannabinoids, but there are other compounds like terpenes and flavonoids, all together, something between, I would say, 70 to 100 different active compounds. But now, it's not a very specific action in our brain or in our scratch here. Now we're taking a lot of compounds to our body, that will float our body and will activate all the receptors all over. It will activate the receptors in our brain, will mimic it, and we will feel hunger. Okay, it will bind the same thing as the endocannabinoid system. It will bind directly to these receptors, 
and will mimic it instead of getting outside single signals like smelling the the uh, the meat or like touching a hot cap now we will get a signal which is doing a bypass without getting a real signal they will bind the receptors and will tell the cells hey increase appetite hey reduce pain they will do what the endocannabinoid should do but now we're mimicking it but a lot of compounds is entering and activate a lot of receptors so we will have increased appetite reduced pain we will feel high we will uh, will be very we will go to sleep and it will be very difficult to wake up in the morning we won't remember our dreams it will affect all the system that the endocannabinoid system is activating and i can talk about every single uh, single system like that but it will take me nine hours it's a lot a lot of actions in our body in the cannabis field there, there is a terminology called the entourage effect the familia effect the pamalia effect okay in 98 professor mishula and professor ben shabbat which was the students in his lab he was a phd student in his lab that day today is a professor in Be'er Sheva university in israel they published a paper called the entourage effect and what they said they said if we're taking one compound for this whole gemish from this whole cannabinoids or, or compounds in, in the plant, if we're taking one compound, it's not working as well as the whole plant. Even though we know that this compound is binding this receptor, if we take it just a purified compound, it's not working as good as the whole plant. And we tried it in my lab, many lab tried it, we know that it's true. And they call it the entourage effect. And what they said, said the single compound don't have enough strength in order to activate the receptors. We need more compounds to come together and to push it. So my example always is that when I'm walking on the beach and some kind of small bum is coming and starting to pushing me and cursing me, I don't mind. But this is, if he's coming with his family, then it's the familiar effect, okay? Then he will be strong enough. It's a nice story, but it's not working like that in, in, in biology, in pharmacology. Because we call it avidity and affinity. It's, it's a lock and a key. The ligand, the message, need to bind the receptors. And there is a structure which is unique. It's like a key and a lock. We call it the key and the lock principle. There is a specific message that will bind the specific receptors and can operate it. It don't need a lot of messages like that. It need to be the right one. So it doesn't matter how many keys I have in my pack. If I don't have the right key, it won't enter and open it. But I need the right key. But more than that, if the key is very, very, very similar, but in, in the small difference, what usually will happen, it will enter the lock, but won't open, won't open. It will stock it. It will be activating or blocking even though they are extremely similar. Okay, and we know it. There are compounds that blocking the receptors, blocking the activating. It's 100% different. Not percent, the degrees. Different between them, even though they are very, very similar. So why we have the entourage effect? Why, if we're taking one compound, it's not acting like the whole one? And the reason is what me and Tanya just told you in the last hour. We have many receptors, many compounded by them, and we're getting a complicated action. One, one compound will bind these receptors and operate one signal. One other compound will add, operate different receptors and operate a different signal. The cell will get few signals, and we're getting a complicated action. In cannabis, it's just good. We call it synergy. You know what? Because cannabis can do harm. God gave us this plant. Of course you understand that I think it's bullshit, right? It's a complicated action and we don't understand it. It might be that one of the compounds will block these receptors while other compounds are trying to activate and they are competing with each other. And we know that it's true. In, in the research that we're doing on epilepsy, 
we have a mice model for epilepsy, genetic epilepsy, and inducible epilepsy. We have a specific strain that not reducing the epilepsy as good as we expected. But if we're cutting it two pieces, we say, okay, let's fractionate it. We're taking 50 compounds in and 50 compounds in. Now, half of this reducing the seizure very well. So in the other half, we have something that's interfering. So it's not synergy. It's complicated action. It's different from the signal, signal, sin, signal compound. It might be that the signal compound will work better. We don't know the problem. We don't have a clue. And if somebody say to tell you that he knows something, or he don't understand what he don't know, or he just not a serious guy. It takes me, I see around two to three startup companies every day that coming to, to my lab. It takes me less than one minute to put them to the ground and then to start to build it again. Usually people just don't know how complicated it is. So, to make it more complicated, cannabis is not one plant. It's a generic name to many, many, many species, to many, many kinds. We call it chemovars. I'm coming from botany. It's very difficult for me to call it species, it's not species. It's chemovars, but they are different. In my lab only, I have 700 different types of cannabis. 700, that every one of them will contain different compounds. So usually we're looking on THC, CBD, maybe CBA, maybe CBG. If we are very, very noble, we look on 12 different compounds. But me, when I'm doing a, a research, if I want to repeat the experiment, I need to dose it. I need to know exactly what I'm putting on the cells. I need to understand everything, all the compounds from the basic to the top. I can't do this experiment. And plants, even if I'm taking the same genetic and then we'll grow them in a different soil, in a different light, they will be different. I'm a, I'm a son of agriculture. We grow strawberries when I was a kid. When you pick a strawberry in the morning or you pick a strawberry afternoon, they have a different taste. The plant is doing more photosynthesis all the day, more sugars in the night is burning the sugars. Today, after five years in plant biology, I understand the system, but as a child, I just knew to pick up the strawberry before sunset. Sunset, yeah. If you touch a plant more, there is something that called touch genes that produce different secondary metabolites. So a plant that's growing in Israel in the winter and planting growing in the summer, they will be the same? The answer is no. So how can I repeat an experiment? How can I work? So in order to solve it, we develop a method in my lab to analyze all the active compounds. All the cannabinoids, all the terpenes, all the flavonoids. We are able to identify 144 cannabinoids, around 120 terpenes, around 25 flavonoids. And if there will be a new one from a new strain that now I'm bringing from Colombia, I will identify it. So how it's looking? If I'm taking 20 strains, different, 20 different types of cannabis. This is from a publication from four months ago that we published. So, there is 20 strains here, and these are the compound, the active compound. You can see THC here or CBD here. And what I'm showing here is heat map. There are numbers, accurate numbers behind it, but the meaning, if it's dark, it's highly expressed in this cannabis, in this strain. If it's white, it's not expressing this one. What I want to show you, these are 20 different cannabis plants that the patient can get in Israel. Look how different they are. So if a patient taking these, these are the active compounds that will enter into his body, will bind the receptors and activate pathways. But if he's taking this cannabis, he's taking different compounds which activate different receptors, and the action can be exactly the opposite. So cannabis can be elevating or can be very uh, tiring. We call it sativa and indica. If we'll find the person that knows to define what is sativa in Indica and can explain me, I'm giving it the Nobel Prize. <laughs> We're doing cultivation with cannabis 5,000 years. We're mixing this plant, okay? So how we can have a specific sativa or Indica? It's like saying that I'm... S Never mind, this is just the Israel and the Jewish say, I will understand what I said, that I was 30% Iraqi and it's not working with that audience. 
So there is not such a thing. But we're saying this is sativa is working more on the brain and elevating an indica. I remember it in the couch. You're smoking it, you're stuck in the couch. <laughs> okay. But actually, it's the same THC, CBD. So why they are different? Because there are other compounds that activate different receptors and we feel it different. And this is the reason. It's totally different. You're taking two CBD strains, high CBD, that patient can get for epilepsy and they look totally different. So in Israel, we have eight authorized growers, eight, just eight, that can supply the patient cannabis. Every one of them will supply something like 10 different camovars, 10 different types of cannabis. They will give them different names. Scooby-Doo, Mickey Mouse, White Widow, these are the real names, real medicines. Okay? <coughs> So all together, we have around 95 different products, 95 different medicines called cannabis that a patient can get. If I'm adding the extract, because if you're extracting with CO2 supercritical butane or press, it will be different compounds. I won't enter into that. I, in the bottom line, I have something like 120 different materials or different medicines, as I call it, that the patient can get. So what we are doing in the last three years, we are doing a database on this patient, understanding that we know from bottom to top what the patient is getting. We know all the cannabinoids, all the different, the flavonoids that the patient didn't get. We can follow up on the patient. Usually my patient has four legs and a tail. But here in Israel, I have 38,000 patients that getting cannabis under a physician prescription and I accept in epilepsy, usually the, the physician is even don't know what the patient is getting. He's writing cannabis. The patient is going to one of these growers, and the growers <coughs> will give him something. The grower, the grower become the physician. In Israel, if it's not oncology, the, the physician prescribes cannabis and the amount. He will prescribe cannabis 30 grams. And we have few physicians like that in the audience, and we can talk about them with them. You can talk about them, how it works. So they prescribe cannabis, 30 grams. This is going to the Minister of Health that will sign on that, said, okay, I believe this doctor that this patient need to get it, will sign on that. And the patient will get an announcement that he have a license to get cannabis. In Israel, the, the, the patient paying a fixed price for the cannabis doesn't matter how much they are getting or what they are getting. It's under health care. So the patient getting announcement that he, have, he can get the cannabis and he don't need to go back to the physician. He's going to the grower and the grower said, oh, so you have a colitis? So this is the, the drug that you need to get. But none of them understand anything. <coughs> The, the, the growers today in Israel, they are my collaborators, very, very, very good friends of mine. But six from the, from the eight don't have, don't finish high school. Literally. One of the growers told me four months ago, he said, Daddy, I have a lot of experience. For 35 years I'm growing and selling cannabis. I told him, you're very cute and you know that you, I love you, but the meaning of that is that for 30 years you were a drug dealer. <laughs> By definition. You have a license to, do, to sell cannabis just five years, but he's selling and growing 35 years. What is the definition of that? We have two types of growers in Israel. People that grow for many years, have a lot of experience, have the strains, and now I'm getting legally to do it. Or <coughs> agriculture that grow flowers and now growing flowers that are more profitable. But both of them understand nothing in medicine, understand nothing in plants, understand nothing in biology. When I'm standing in a, in a talk in Portland, 2,700 people in the audience, and I'm showing and said, this is a cell, and this is the nucleus, and in the nucleus there is a DNA, there is, whoa, in the crowd. I don't need to do much more than, much more than this. Because this world is very, very flat. It's still run between in, in people with a lot of emotions. Amazing people that want to change the world. They were in Woodstock, 
from then they are trying to change the world. But they don't understand the medicine. They don't understand the complexity. So, working with these people, we started to create the database. It's still not accurate as I want to. I don't know how many paths the, the patient's taking. If he's smoking to the end of the joint or, or shutting before. But at least I know what are the compounds that are entering to his body. In this database, we have 5,500 patients with elevation of 80 patients every week. It took me three years to understand how to do that. I'm a cell biologist. I didn't know how to approach a patient. So in these years, it took me a lot of time to understand that having a, a, an app on the, uh, on the iPhone or putting in Facebook for the patient to participate, the first 400 patients was, were between 24 to, to 35 years old. All of them, the cannabis was amazing and the things that we need to legalize. These are the 400 first patients. But these are not the real patients. Why a lady, 74 years old, with pancreatic cancer, that have half a year to live, will spend 15 minutes every month on me? There is no logic. I need to reach this patient and to, to have kind, kind of incentive to work with me. I can't pay the patient, I can't give presents, I'm academia. <coughs> but I need to create incentive. It took me a lot of understanding how to do that. Today I am paying salary for nurses in the hospitals to be the cannabis nurses. In Ichilo, which is the biggest hospital in Israel, it's the biggest? No. no, sorry. One of the biggest. Okay, hospital in Israel, in the pain department, I'm paying the nurse salary. I'm educating her on the endocannabinoid system, on cannabis, the types of the cannabis, everything. But today, when a physician in the pain department decides that his patient needs to get cannabis, said before that, go to a flat, she will explain you a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. What are the different way of administration of the cannabis and so on, and then come back to me. These 15 minutes with the patient create incentive. She given a card and said, hey, if you need something, call us. But do us a favor, fill this questionnaire, it will help us to, to help you. And this cause incentive. So I'm bleeding tons of time and money to reach the patient to bring this database. I want to show one example of this database, why I think it must be accurate in that way. So first of all, the idea is to follow up on all the cannabis in Israel. So today, in the last two and a half years, every cannabis, every batch, every time that the grower pick a batch or make an extract, is coming to my lab for full identification for all the cannabis triplets and flavonoids. I succeed in, in 80% of them. There are few growers that picking every two weeks and I can't follow up. But I have an average of 80% of the products that coming out to the patient that I can follow up on everything. Maybe a little bit more than 80%. The other arm is to follow up on the patient. We have a questionnaire for every indication, for epilepsy, for pain, for Crohn and colitis, for every indication we have a specific questionnaire and the, 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 the patient are filling, filling up. And the idea to merge these two, to say, okay, these 50 strains elevate appetite in 70% of the patient. What are the difference between the compounds? What are the common compounds in these strains that are not existing in the strains and not elevating appetite? And these to take to animal models and clinical trials. So today if I have a, a, a mice model for sleep, I know exactly which strains are in Israel are the best that causing the patient to sleep and can't wake up. And which are the strains that when the patient takes them, they can't fall asleep. And then I have the tip of the rope to start to do research. But more than that, I can now take all the strains in Israel and put them in groups. Not group of THC, CBD, C CBG. Other groups, I can put them in five different groups. And even in this group, there are different combinations. At least I know the groups. So when I'm starting to do a research now on pancreatic cancer, I can take few types from here, few types from here, few types from here, and have 
a variety of the cannabis. I have a good start point, better start point. You need to, you to understand that sometimes the same genetic, so what we see here, it's four plants from the same genetic, the same types of plant. So in cannabis, we usually not using seeds, we're using stems in order that the, the plant that we're putting will be exactly the same plant, exact, as the, exactly the same genetic as the mothers. So these are four plants, the same genetics, they grew in four different greenhouse in the same grower. We, we plan to do in a, in a clinical trial and we need a huge amount of this extract. So one of the growers grow for us the same genetic. And what we wanted here was the THCVA. You see that one genetic totally lost the THCVA. The same one just growing in different in greenhouse. It may be different angle to the sun, maybe other things that happen in this greenhouse. But the meaning of that, that it's changing all the time. So this is the, from that reason, I'm following up every batch. So if you summarize it and you look, these are four different cannabis plants that if you look on the basic eight different cannabis needs, they look very alike. But if you look on the effect, you can see <coughs> few effects that are, very, that are very different. If you look on memory impairment, these strains uh, is causing 9.3% memory impairment, while these strains causing 22%. If you look on, what is the significant here? On, on this one, energetic. This strain increased 29.3% energetic, this strain 60% energetic. So even though they look totally the same for the growers and every people in the world, because this is what we know to look, they will have big differences. But more than this, we don't have just cannabinoids. We have also terpenes and flavonoids. And we can do that the same thing for terpenes and flavonoids and see the differences between the terpenes and flavonoids and the different effect of these plants on the patient. So one example in the three minutes that I have, one of the studies that we did, I know, I thought that Adi Aran will be here, he's not here, right? No, no, he couldn't come. Okay, so Adi Aran did the clinical trials on, uh, on autistic kids, and in Israel we started to treat autistic kids a few years ago. It started with autistic kids that have seizures and got cannabis to reduce seizures, and then we saw good effect on other parameters, reducing anxiety, reducing violence, increased communication, uh, improved sleep disorders. The average in our study for the times that the patient was waking up was 7.8 times, and after starting to take the cannabis, it's reducing to 2.1. Think about the family with the autistic kids, 16 years old, that waking up every night eight times screaming, and now he's sleeping a full, a full night. Just this, this one can change the life of the family. So we checked many parameters and the patient in Israel, the kids, autistic kids that can get cannabis are just the very severe one. It's ki kids that not communicate, usually not eye contact even. Kids that are extremely violent, usually walking with hand tight and the helmets because they can knock their head to the wall and think they're fainting. And kids that none of the medicine can help them. These are the kids that was allowed to start treating. And we saw a, a huge improvement in these kids. Actually, it's the most strong indication that I'm familiar. 82.5% improvement in 32 different indication or parameters that we checked. Anxi anxiety, violence, sleep disorder, eat disorder, uh, and, and, and more and more, okay? What we look here, I think it's, it's aggressiveness, okay? Huge improvement, so blue is improvement, green is no change, and red, it's making it worse. And you see huge improvement. So two things that we saw in these kids that are extremely interesting, one of them, the difference between male and female. Look on this, improving habits. 53% improving male, zero in female. 
Repetitive movement, 48% improving in male, 9 in female. Eye contact, 47% improving in male, 0 improving in, 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 in female. Respond to name, 50% improving male, 0 in female. As my wife said after she saw that, yes, we don't have a problems with eye contact. Then. <laughs> you don't listen to me. I, this is after 25 years, as you said. You know? Okay, so this is amazing, and they don't have a clue still why, why this phenomenon. But the other things, our strength is to look on, this, on, the, on the different strains. So these are the, the different strains that these kids got. We follow up 120 different kids for more than a year. So, as again, blue is improvement, green is no change, red, red is making it worse. So you see a huge diversity, so in this figure we're looking just on the male. So you see that male uh, kids, uh, male kids that took these trains, 100% of them have improvement. This is aggressiveness here, I think, okay? And there are strains that was less good. This is pure CBD, seven kids took pure CBD, fetal play from Tikkun Olam company, and you see that just two kids show improvement and 15 of them didn't show improvement. So we see that even though, I didn't say that, all the strains were high CBD, low THC, 20 to one CBD to THC in most of the cases. And you see the differences. But in Israel, it's a community. We're a small country. Every now, everybody knows everyone. So the kids that started to take this one and didn't help, they have a WhatsApp with all these the families. So this, kid, this family said, hey, you're taking the wrong one. Move to this company. And these kids that didn't work for them, of course, or he worked with me in the Technion, or I was with him in the, in the army, or he married my sister. This is Israel, OK? So they will call. And of course, we'll help them, right? So we'll take a hey, go to this one. This working the best. But these are plants. And which plants? This is the strain that these kids are getting that improve all of, all of them that was the best one. But this is a plant. And this plant's growing for three months. So this, uh, this company that grow this ran out very fast. So many, many kids started to move to them. The Minister of Health saw the results, how much is improving, and opened the gate to more kids to get there. So from 100 kids, we jumped in less than one year to 800 kids and getting there. With huge improvement, all the kids that started to take the other one that didn't work, work moved to this company, and they ran out. But why, why does it matter? It's CBD and THC, 20 to 1. On the bottom, it even doesn't written anything else. It's written. 20 to 1, CBD to THC. So they just need to change it to different strain that they have. They were very honest that they, they announced that this strain is right now. They are giving now this strain, which is exactly the same, the same one. 20 to 1, CBD to THC. On the bottom it's written the same thing. Instead of giving that, they are giving that. Nobody cares. Not the physician, not the families, not the girls. It's the same thing. In five days, we had a huge crisis. All the kids that moved from here to here, 44 kids crashed. They become extremely violent. Much more than they were before they started to take the cannabis. One of the kids jumped on his mother and beat her in a way that needed medical care. One kid, his father is a professor in the Technion, he told me that in order to control him, his, he and he, another son break the, the autistic kids two arms. One kid went out of the window, when the window was, was closed, cut his body all over. Extremely, extremely violence and, and, and tough stories. Just because they changed the strain. It's true that this strain have the same amount of CBD, the same amount of THC, but look on other compounds which are totally different. For me, it's a gold mine. It's a not terrible story, but for me it's a gold mine as a scientist. Now, I narrow down to seven to nine different compounds that I can go to animal model and check why these ones are important 
to reduce anxiety and, and violence. Because my, run, my time ran out, I will skip the last thing and I will show it in my next presentation. I just want to say uh, thanks for my amazing team. This is Dr. Shirley Berman that did all the, endo the phytocannabinoid and the endocannabinoid identification. This is Dr. Uh, Iga Luria, which is head of the autoimmune uh, department in my lab. This is Dr. Uh, Liran Baram that doing the cancer work that I will talk uh, later. And this is Dr. Gil Evitus that doing all the uh, neuroscience in my lab. And this is all the team that doing the, the hard work. Thank you very much. I was always thinking how pediatricians and child neurologists in Israel are happy because they have so many chemovars and they can use whatever. But now I should change my... <laughs> so maybe sometimes it is better that yeah. you know exactly what is inside and uh, what are the effects and what are the side effects. Please, for the questions. Thank you. Excellent, excellent presentation. And, uh, of course, expanded our views on that. You mentioned that uh, you ended up with five different groups in this. Um, right. Yeah, and so these groups are not based on composition exactly, or what they're no, based it, on. It, it's based on composition, but 144 different cannabinoids, and not just two. So, uh -huh. so in my lab, I have uh, uh, computer scientists and, and other people that I don't have uh, understand their language. And they're running these programs and they're grouping it in, in different groups which are s more similar to each other. So in the autistic kids, which I, what I didn't say, when we had this, I went to, to, to my group and said, okay, we have in Israel 14 different high CBD, low THC strains. Find me which one is the most similar to the one that's working. And even though it wasn't the THC CBD, they immediately came and said, this is... 51% similarity on that and that and that, which I don't understand anything they are talking, okay? But we can find similarity on other compositions, yeah. or the turpins, flavonoids, and candy yeah. can. And then, then work the same or similar way also. I, I, don't, I, I can't answer that oh, yet. Okay. I, we, we just submit a paper for mm -hmm. cancer uh, research, and, and in this paper, in the end, we are showing in statistically that if you can calculate 14 different cannabinoids, you can maybe uh, predict the effect on this specific uh, type of treatment. These predictions, you know, I, as a biologist, until you don't try four times, you don't believe it. So I don't know. It's predictions. I don't know to answer that. No, Not yet. Good bioinformatics approach. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much.